Okay, it is uh, July 15th. Um, we are in Beacons Field. Um, we are with uh, Dr. Tarasov, and uh, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. So we're going to begin with just some basic questions. So could you please state your full name? You know, I'm uh, Peter Tarasov, and I'm 81. I was born in April the 11th, 1934. And where were you born? I was born in Montreal, but brought up in Verdun, which is at that time was a separate municipality on the island of Montreal. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? My uh, parents were immigrants. My mother came to Canada from uh, what was then Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, and my father from Russia. Uh, and he had got caught up in the Civil War following the Russian Revolution. And there's quite a story there, but that would be for some other time. But he came to this, I do want to mention, he came to this country, age 17, no family, just by himself with some other boys who had been in the same military school and made his way. <laughs> well, and they, they came here escaping the conflict? Is that really what my, they Well, my father, about? my mother just joined a sister that was already here. So uh, I, uh, so I grew, as I say, I grew up in, in Verdun and went to a public school there. It was called Bantine School and Verdun High School and uh, subsequently went on to uh, university. Uh, as a child, I was always interested in natural history and uh, science in one way or another. Uh, particularly, uh, my particular interests were rocks and minerals and fossils, and that's where I got started in my avocation that continues to this uh, day. I went uh, from high school, I went to uh, McGill University. At that time, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to uh, do, but it was basically a choice between geology, uh, mining engineering, and metallurgical engineering. And uh, in the summer of 1953, I was hired by the Geological Survey of Canada as a field assistant on a, uh, a survey crew working in the Yukon Territory. The uh, leader of our crew was uh, Bob Boyle, Dr. R. W. Boyle, who's famous as one of the uh, eminent geos chemists in, in Canada. And our job was to uh, do a preliminary survey of the mines and mineral deposits. Uh, these were lead silver deposits. And so I spent the summer uh, doing field surveying, uh, doing the usual thing, uh, walking up and down hills, looking at rocks, fighting mosquitoes and black flies in the bush. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had already been in the first year of engineering at that time. And one of our uh, requirements was to write an essay on our summer experience, uh, summer, they call it a summer essay. So I decided to write an essay about the mineralogy of, of one of the silver mines. Mine was called Belkino Mine, which interestingly has is, is re been reopened in recent years. And uh, so I started working on, on this summer essay. And uh, Bob Boyle was my sort of uh, advisor, mentor, coach. He really taught me how to write technical reports. And uh, we'll get to this later, but he was one of the people I look for at as having influenced my life. Uh, anyways, the long shot of it was that I decided that uh, geology in the field wasn't for me. And How so? And uh, I don't know, I was just maybe, I'm not sure that I want to spend my life <laughs> fighting the bush. Yeah, in the bush, yeah. <laughs> and uh, also mining engineering. Now mind you, I was, we did some underground work as well. And uh, uh, one of my jobs for that summer was to uh, do some uh, uh, maps of the underground workings in, in one of the mines. And so I got to uh, interface a bit with uh, one of the mining engineers and I had sort of second thoughts about, uh, about mining engineering. And so when I got back to university, it was metallurgical engineering. Now I should uh, step back a, 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 a 
a, a few years, I would say more than a few years, but my father, when he came to Canada, started out uh, as a farm worker and then uh, worked uh, in the forestry industry and then uh, into mining. And he spent a number of years as a miner in the uh, Kirkland Lake uh, gold mines. And uh, from Kirkland Lake, he went to uh, Naranda and he worked actually for, for Naranda Mines years before I joined Naranda. And uh, his last job there was on the crew sinking the number two shaft. So uh, I already had somebody in my family, my father, yeah. who had been in the industry. And in fact, he was an influence on me in several ways. Uh, but one of them he talked about his mining experiences and he talked about rocks and, and yeah. so forth. So that, so that helped you with your... And he had a few samples to show me. Yeah. And, okay. uh, so that got, got me further interested. Anyways, going back to, uh, to uh, McGill, uh, it's a great university. I was in uh, the uh, metallurgical engineering uh, stream, but at that time, mining metallurgy was to, together because it was a small, small department. And uh, from there, uh, eventually went on to graduate school. But uh, I do want to go back to uh, high school because my first uh, job was when I was 16. I worked as a junior draftsman for Crane Limited. Crane Limited was a manufacturer of plumbing supplies, valves and, and the like, and had a plant in Montreal. It was a foundry. And uh, so the first summer I worked with them uh, was as a junior draftsman, but the next two summers I went to the plant and worked in their control laboratory, where, uh, among other things, I got to uh, testing uh, uh, samples of the metals uh, in terms of their various physical properties. The foundry was a brass foundry and also a uh, cast iron foundry, so I was exposed to uh, you know metallurgy right there before I even went to university. And uh, so I had some early experience uh, related to, uh, to metallurgy. Um, when I got to, uh, to McGill and after my first year, uh, first summer at, in the Yukon, the next summer I uh, worked for Quebec Iron and Titanium Corporation in, in Sorel. And interestingly, uh, at that time uh, I, I was hired by the research department and the research director was none other than somebody called Jerry Hatch. And uh, people in the mining metallurgical industry certainly recognize the name sure. of, of Hatch. Hatch today is a major world uh, engineering company. So I can say that I worked for Jerry way back when. <laughs> and uh, so I spent the following uh, several summers working uh, at, at QIT. How big uh, was uh, Hatch at that time? Uh, well, Hatch wasn't... Uh, he was working for Quebec Iron Titanium okay. Company. He was their director of research. And uh, a lot of people may not know uh, that he, he was a, uh, a major reason why uh, QIT, as it's called now, uh, became uh, the successful company that, that it is. There were problems in, in the smelting of uh, the ilmenite ore, and uh, uh, Jerry Hatch was uh, asked to, you know, figure out how, how to operate these furnaces so that you know they would do what they're supposed to do. And I should mention, at that time, QIT was uh, controlled, owned by uh, Kennecott Copper Corporation in the U.S. two thirds and New Jersey Zinc Company, one-third. And the furnaces that were being used there were modifications of something called a Sterling furnace, which was used for training zinc ore down in, in New Jersey. And uh, adapting these furnaces to treat ilmenite was uh, a major uh, uh, problem. And uh, so Jerry, with, with a crew, actually uh, took over the operation of one of the furnaces and uh, eventually uh, he and his crew sh showed 
how to operate the firm is properly. And so this was one of his first accomplishments, one might say. Uh, anyways, I uh, had experience at that time in, uh, in ilmenite uh, treatment as well and was involved in some uh, work on the, uh, uh, rather than smelting ilmenite ore, uh, treating it in a shaft furnace, a reduction furnace. And I got involved with uh, uh, some other projects that were qu quite interesting at, at, at the time. Uh, one of my uh, mentors as such was Professor J.U. McEwen uh, at McGill. He was the chairman of the department. And uh, he always encouraged me in one way or another. And uh, when I uh, graduated from uh, McGill in metallurgical engineering, it was Professor McEwen that suggested that I go on to graduate school. But he said, no, I don't think you should continue here at McGill. I think you should go to another university. And he said, probably you should go to Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Good school. But was and there a reason why he, he wanted you to leave? Because uh, you get a different uh, experience, yeah. okay. you know, uh, in, in university, which is important. Uh, yeah, broaden your broaden your horizons, your horizons yeah. for sure. And uh, I ended up with a uh, fellowship. Uh, it was called the Kennecott Fellowship, and uh, I it was it was Professor McEwen that uh, had a big hand in in securing this fellowship for me. And I'm sure that Jerry Hatch was also involved because at that time uh, QIT, as I mentioned, was still uh, controlled by by uh, Kennecott. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I uh, went on to, uh, to MIT. And uh, at MIT, I was in the metal, what was called the metallurgy department and uh, started out on a master's degree, but then uh, continued on to a, a, a doctorate and uh, my research there was involved in the uh, re reaction between molten silicate, it was like a slag, and, uh, and a metal. It was a specifically reduction of silica from a silicate slag. The, uh, what we were interested in was what was called the kinetics of the reaction between a metal and a, and a, sil and a molten silicate. And, uh, the, in this case, it was silicon being reduced uh, by aluminum. And interestingly, this project was in part sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission uh, in the U.S. because at that time they were looking at ways of, uh, of recovering or treating uh, uh, the product of nuclear reactors to separate uh, the components and they were looking at the possibility of reacting with a molten salt, as, it, as you would call it. And so this was of interest to them as the kinetics of, you know, the, the rate of reaction and the mechanism of reactions between a molten silicate or a salt and a, and a, a molten alloy of, could it be uranium or plutonium or what have you. Uh, so, uh, anyways, I graduated in uh, 1962, and uh, a doctorate, and with a doctorate, and uh, I had opportunities in the U.S. I had applied to various uh, research laboratories that were metallurgically related. Was that uh, was that going to be your plan after your doctorate? Yeah, was that you're going to work in research? In research, not not in in an academic uh, environment, but in industry in labs uh, in, in a lab. And among the people that I talked to was Kennecott and Asarco and uh, also U.S. Steel Corporation and, and some others. But I decided I was going to come back to, uh, to Canada. And uh, anyways, I ended up at uh, QIT in uh, what was uh, their research department, which is a very small department. It was for a handful of people. And uh, I was there for two years. And uh, in 1964, I got a, uh, a phone call from uh, uh, Dr. Themelis, Nick Themelis, uh, at Naranda Research Center. And the Naranda Research Center had uh, just been open in 1963, it was, it was started. And uh, 
Uh, Nick Thamelis happened to be a, a fellow graduate of McGill in, in 1956. He was in chemical engineering and I was in metallurgical engineering, but I, had, but I knew him. And he asked me whether I'd be interested in joining them to spearhead a project on the uh, continuous smelting and converting of, of copper concentrates to copper. And uh, at that point, I wasn't very happy with uh, my position at, uh, at QIT. I felt I was being underutilized, frankly. And so I jumped at the opportunity to, uh, to join Naranda. And so that was my start to, with Naranda, which at that time was called Naranda Mines Limited. The uh, research center uh, had been established uh, at the instigation of John Bradfield, who was president of uh, Marina Mines Limited. He felt that there was an opportunity for the company to advance its technology and its business uh, success by having its own research laboratory. And uh, it was decided to have the laboratory in, in Montreal, in part because of the proximity of McGill University and also because Narend at that time and still does uh, uh, had a, a, a copper refinery in Montreal East okay. and a brass mill in Montreal East, and uh, uh, so it was uh, a good good site for a research center. Sorry, around what time was that? It was 1963. Okay. Uh, and, and how uh, spread out was Naranda at that time? Like where, uh, which other locations? Well, the major, uh, Naranda, of course, started as a, as a copper gold mine. This is the horn mine. And then it uh, expanded into lead and zinc. Uh, at that time, Brunswick Mining and Smelting was a uh, subsidiary. Uh, there was Metogamy Lake Mines and a zinc mine in Quebec. Uh, there was Brenda, which is a molybdenum mine in British Columbia, and uh, Montre the Naranda was sort of vertically uh, integrated from, from mine to smelter, refinery, into brass mills, and into products. It had uh, it, uh, produced uh, uh, co copper tubing, uh, copper wire, it had a plant uh, near Arn Prior which produced uh, cladding for fuel elements for nuclear reactors. Uh, it got into aluminum, there's Naranda aluminum, which still exists in Missouri. And so it was a large oh, sort yeah. of metallurgical, uh, mining metallurgical uh, complex. And as a result, in fact, at the research center, we got involved in, uh, in uh, research uh, in terms of processes and products of not only copper but zinc and lead. Yeah, you had really the aluminum. And so much choice of yeah, things to research. Yeah, it was a you know broad, broad, uh, broad range of projects. Uh, but key to uh, the establishment of the center was to find a, a director, and uh, they picked uh, Dr. William H. Govan, Bill Govan, as we call him. He was a chemical engineer uh, and had established a reputation. He was a professor at McGill, but had also worked uh, in, a, in industry. And so it was his job to uh, set up the uh, research center and, and hire the people, the key people, and, and so forth. And in fact, uh, I earlier mentioned uh, Dr. Themelis. He had been a graduate student of Dr. Govans, and uh, so he, he was hired to head up what was called the Chemical Engineering uh, Department. Uh, the research center then was organized by discipline, so you had a Chemical Engineering Department, a Chemistry Department, an Analytical Chemistry Department, a Physical Metallurgy Department, and, and so forth. This eventually was changed. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, so I was hired to uh, as project leader on the development of what became the, uh, was the Miranda process for copper smelting. And uh, this entailed uh, what we call semi-pilot plant scale uh, tests. So we actually operated a small furnace uh, in the research center was in Point Claire 
and uh, we had a, a, a small reverberatory furnace, which is a copper smelting furnace. Miranda at that time, I forgot to mention gas bay copper, of course, was in the, in the fold. And uh, at Miranda, we had uh, uh, two reverberatory furnaces. Uh, and at gas bay, there was a reverberatory furnace. And this furnace had been built before I arrived at the center to conduct some tests on the uh, smelting of copper concentrates in particular for gas bay copper. And uh, so we used this reverberatory furnace as, as the test bed, you might say, for the Miranda process. And uh, the, uh, this was on a scale of maybe uh, you know, we would smelt uh, a ton or so of copper concentrate. Uh, now you have to visualize that the research center was uh, in a in a suburb, there were houses around, not very far away, and uh, because we were producing a lot of SO2, and I'm not sure that we should be talking about this, but at that time, you know, the environmental consciousness that we have today was was not there really. We did have a, a scrubber, an elementary uh, scrubber, using uh, sodium hydroxide and water to try to scrub out uh, SO2 from this furnace. But I'm sure if you went outside of the building, uh, I know if you went outside the building, you could smell SO2. Yeah. And uh, one reason, one uh, result was that we conducted our tests at night. We would start somewhere around midnight and uh, run our tests during the night when the neighbors were all asleep. <laughs> so they wouldn't notice as much. <laughs> they wouldn't notice as much. <clears throat> um, so uh, this, uh, well, this has all been published, you know, the uh, description of this furnace and, and so forth, but the, uh, the concept of the process was to continuously feed copper concentrate to a furnace and gradually smelt it to uh, what we call a copper mat, convert the copper mat to what's called bliss, uh, copper white, co white metal, which is copper sulfide, and then convert that to metallic copper. <clears throat> in sort of a continuous manner. And so it was visualized that you would have a, a long vessel, a cylindrical vessel uh, with tweers, very similar to what uh, was called, was known as a copper converter at the time, but a rather elongated copper converter. So at one end you're feeding concentrate and in theory copper is coming out the other end, which eventually we did realize. But in the furnace that we had uh, for our research purposes, uh, we we could use tweers, so we used uh, lances. Sorry, uh, what are tweers? Tweers are uh, pipes which uh, you use to inject air or oxygen-enriched air into oh, a molten yeah, bath. Sorry. Tu yeah, tu yes. the tuer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, tuer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Tuer in English, yeah, yeah. tuer. <laughs> yeah, for sure. C'est ça. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, but we used uh, pipes which were uh, covered with uh, with refractory to protect the, uh, the the metal pipe itself, which was a uh, high temperature stainless steel, and injected the air directly into a molten bath and fed copper concentrate into that. Okay. But we were able to show that we could simultaneously feed copper concentrate to a bath of of uh, mat and convert the mat. To metallic copper. So at the end of the of a, of a test, we would end up with a layer of slag, a layer of matte uh, white metal, which is just copper sulfide, and copper uh, in in the bath. Uh, now, we of course, when the uh, process was uh, later piloted and eventually developed, and used tweers. What I like to uh, think of, think is that we missed an opportunity at that time because we used these lances as a convenience uh, because we didn't we couldn't use tweers in this furnace. But many years later, uh, there was a process developed in in Australia they called the Osmelt process uh, for uh, smelting copper concentrates, lead concentrates, and the like in a in a, in a vertical vessel. And they used a lance in that process. And uh, had we had the foresight, we might have gone 
to you know using a lance for the for the process, but we didn't. But that's the nature of research. Sometimes you don't really you know think about well, why are we using this? Maybe we could use it in a different yeah. uh, in a different way. One one thing that's important to uh, note in in the development of this process was. That what I mentioned earlier, that you know, Dr. Govan was a chemical engineer and uh, Dr. Thamelis was a chemical engineer. Chemical engineers are used to processes that operate continuously. You feed the one end of a, of a vessel and your product comes out the other end. Whereas at that time, copper smelting and converting was what we call a batch process. You, you smelt it in one vessel, you transferred to another vessel and converted the... Uh, mat to white metal and copper in a, in a second vessel and then probably had a third vessel in fact uh, an anode furnace to further refine the copper and cast it into anodes and then that went to the copper refinery and they said well you know why can't you do this continuously and that was the germ of, of the idea so the actual inventors of the patent for that were Nick Themelis and Paul Spira who was a colleague of mine at the time, and another chemical engineer. Uh, so uh, this idea of uh, you know transferring f ideas from one discipline to another very important. I think that's come to be recognized mm -hmm. uh, over the years that you know you need to see you know what's out there, what are different approaches that can be used, and not have sort of blinkers. <laughs> yeah. um, well, from uh, from being project leader on this project, I later uh, became group leader in what was called the e Economics and Process Development Department. Uh, now, interesting, we did, we had an economics group, a group that would uh, look at the potential economics of any of the research projects that we were working on, uh, and you know, what. Is it something that if we're successful, you know, we'll pay off. What's the payout? Okay. Because uh, it's very important that your research objectives, you know, meet a business need, and if they meet a business need, they certainly have to be there has to be a, a return on the investment. So that was a continuous thing that we had a a, a system uh, we called it uh, investigation of new research ideas. There was some monies available for anybody in the in the research center who had an idea of doing something differently t to run a few tests uh, or experiments or even just a paper study to sort of develop the idea further. Uh, it could be, we call it blue sky research, it could be all, virtually on anything as long as it had some relationship to uh, Naranda's uh, businesses. And uh, so th this was uh, you know part of if, if somebody had an idea, then at some point it was a project proposal made, but it had to have some business uh, uh, reasons, you know, okay, what, what are the potential benefits? Not in a lot of detail, but enough yeah. to, that there was uh, potential there, economic potential. Yeah. It's interesting, you don't, you don't always hear about the research department be, being fused with uh, an economics department, I guess. But it makes sense. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But uh, quite right. often the two are <clears throat> are not talked about. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Uh, anyways, in the uh, economics and process development, uh, the process development side came that the that department. Or these are all small departments, I, I must say. Uh, one is one of its mandates was was to take uh, something that was developed in the laboratory and uh, prove it on a larger scale, a pilot plant scale. And at that time, uh, Gaspé Copper uh, was looking at treating uh, oxide copper. Uh, now, oxide copper, these are uh, copper carbonates, copper silicates. Uh, and they had a large uh, tonnage of uh, copper oxide in the copper ore body. And Gaspé Copper was looking at, well, how can we treat this? This is not something that you can treat in a, uh, in a smelter uh, sulfide 
concentrate smelter. And uh, at the uh, center, they looked at something at uh, leaching the uh, this ore, copper or oxide ore with acid, and uh, had shown that uh, the uh, oxide ore could be treated by acid leaching, and uh, developed a uh, interesting idea, which was to use uh, bacterial leaching rather than straight acid leaching. There was some uh, pyrite uh, present in the ore, but you could also add add pyrite. The bacteria would would attack the uh, the pyrite, convert it to sulfuric acid, and the sulfuric acid was then uh, be used to leach out the copper carbonates in, in the ore. So the this was bacterial called bacterial leaching, and uh, there was there were other companies uh, looking at this this as well. Uh, the initial work was done what we call columns, so just uh, a co visualize a column of ore, and you're passing uh, solution through it, acidic solution with these bacteria in it. But at Gaspe, we built a, a large uh, uh, a heap. Now, in the copper business, a heap was like a, a dump uh, of ore, and you uh, per percolated uh, your leaching solution through the dump and collected the uh, effluent solution at the base, which contained copper, and processed that to recover copper. So we built a large uh, uh, pilot uh, Heap leaching plant, and my responsibility was uh, to uh, to manage, uh, oversee the uh, the operation of this this plant. Uh, and also at that time, I got involved in uh, on the product side. Uh, the research center had developed a uh, a new iron alloy for uh, producing. Uh, balls uh, used in ball mills uh, in crushing uh, grinding ore. I, Miranda had a foundry in British Columbia called Ocean Foundries which which produced these grinding balls as we call them and the center had developed an improved uh, grinding ball that had better resistance would last longer and therefore reduce the cost of, of grinding and uh, so we uh, had to run uh, Tests on actually producing the uh, these grinding balls using with this new composition called cumuloy at the time out in uh, in British Columbia. So I was involved in that as well. How um, if if I don't know if you know, but what what would be the a regular the lifespan of a regular ball at the time compared to the ones you were working on? Ah, uh, that I won't remember no. now. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think we can, uh, just m moving on, uh, uh, I uh, later was head of the uh, chemical engineering department, uh, which was primarily involved with uh, uh, process development on a, using pyrometallurgy, i.e. Uh, high temperature processes, uh, both for treating copper concentrates, uh, GIR was in the under process, of course. Uh, lead concentrates. We had even looked at uh, applying the under process to treatment of nickel concentrates, and uh, and and so forth. And uh, later, well, I went up through the ranks. We and uh, was eventually I was appointed assistant director, and then uh, in 1988. Uh, I I succeeded Dr. Govan as Director of Research and, and Development. Uh, by that time, the Research Center uh, had uh, about 140 personnel, uh, 70 engineers and scientists, and a budget around $17 million uh, annually. Uh, and uh, in 1988, uh, the a new director was was brought in, uh, and I was uh, pro appointed vice president uh, and chief scientist of uh, Miranda Mines Limited. Now, this came about because some years earlier, uh, 
Miranda had uh, the corporate office had appointed a committee to look at uh, you know the technology and how technology should be managed and what the opportunities might be now if we step back from that uh, Miranda was already Miranda mines had already expanded broadly into into the metals industry uh, different different metals and was vertically integrated but also uh, this is when Naranda got involved into forest products and oil and gas uh, and the idea was that uh, because of the cyclical nature of the of the uh, metal business not various metals particularly in terms of price that you know would go, prices would go up and then they would go down depending on the economy but maybe to offset this if you were in other industries, uh, they would sort of uh, even out the uh, the ups and downs in terms of the bo ultimate bottom line of, of the corporation. So, and uh, of course, forest products are still the natural resources, which which minerals uh, were, and oil and gas was also natural resources. So Naranda then expanded quite broadly into, of course, in forest products. It was eventually took over Macmillan Bloedel, which is a major forest products company in, in British Columbia, and uh, other uh, forest product uh, companies. It was one in New Brunswick and uh, got into uh, lumber and uh, plywood and, and so forth. It was also uh, Naranda got involved in looking at New business opportunities. Uh, you know what else could Naranda do besides uh, you know, the natural resource industry? And uh, looked at uh, taking an an interest uh, in particularly smaller startup companies that could develop into uh, into something larger. Um, one of these small startups, if you want to call it that, was really small. But there was a uh, professor in uh, Nova Scotia that was developing uh, a, a new technology for producing gallium arsenide. And gallium arsenide was a key component in uh, developing chips, uh, computer chips, as an alternative to silicon. And so this was seen as a, an opportunity, and uh, so I got involved in uh, in monitoring uh, the uh, work of the small startup, so gallium arsenide. Uh, that never never panned out, uh, and there were they not even looked at waste uh, treatment, uh, uh, you know, recycling of uh, of uh, garbage, basically. Uh, but quite a quite a variety of. Uh, of potential opportunities. When I look back at this, I, I wonder, you know, what did it really make make sense? Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, that I think is unfortunate is that uh, uh, Naranda probably missed an opportunity. Maybe it should have stayed in in mining and metallurgy and looked at expanding and becoming a world leader in, in, in that area. Yeah. Uh, when I look generally at, at the mining metallurgical scene as it was in the, in the 70s and 80s when I was involved, you know, we had, uh, we had uh, Naranda, of course, we had Inco, we had Falcon Bridge, uh, yeah, on the steel side, we had Steel Company of Canada, so Delco, clear. we had DeFasco, we had Alcan. And you look there, where are all these companies now? Uh, all have been taken over by so-called you know, foreign yeah. interests. European companies. European interests. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, you look at uh, <clears throat> other countries. Look at Australia. Australia had an early history in mining and metallurgy similar to the Canadian one, but they managed to build world-class companies that are still existing, looking, uh, looking at BHP or Billiton or Rio Tinto. They all uh, started in Australia. You know. 
you know, I think we in Canada missed the boat somehow. Canadians that were involved, uh, a merger between Naranda and Inco and Falcon Bridge uh, could have created, yeah. you know, a, a rural powerhouse. How, how do you uh, how do you see or try to explain that phenomenon? Uh, <laughs> that's 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 tough a good question. <laughs> tough question. Uh, I don't know. It's of course you have to look at uh, the shareholders and who are the controlling shareholders and what do they want to get out of the company. And I, I mean, I wasn't privy to any of this, so I'm you know I'm just speculating. But I look at uh, you know the controlling shareholders of Naranda at the time, and they probably just saw an opportunity to you know uh, make a, a big return on their investment. Uh, by selling off the company because they basically put it up for 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 sale, uh, and these were not uh, the kind of people that you know created Naranda in the first place. Uh, just as a specific example, I mean Naranda was initially created by you know people who were miners. They may have had a non-mining background, but they were miners. That's what they called themselves, and. Uh, you know, the Bradfields, uh, who was a, a geologist and the founding president, and uh, there was Murdoch, and these people saw themselves as mining people, and uh, not, they didn't come from a, an accounting okay. or a financial background. Mind you, Alf Powis, who was a major force in Miranda, uh, was, of course, a, an accountant, and uh, Adam Zimmerman, who was his successor, was a, another accountant, and uh, you know Naranda did very well in, under their leadership. Uh, but uh, you know, I think at that time, I don't know for certain, but I think the uh, ownership was probably well distributed. Uh, but eventually, the you know ownership started being concentrated, yeah. and then the controlling shareholders and. You know, it's what they saw or didn't yeah, see. The people in charge maybe also were yeah, um, yeah. too but, distanced from, but the you actual, have to, uh, from the actual product, from the actual mining metallurgy. Well, it's, you know, it's it's looking in the future. Where where are we headed? What, you know, what what are the opportunities out there? Let's grow this business instead of you know <laughs> selling it off. Uh, but then you can ask, you know, what happened to uh, Stelco? You know, where is it today? What happened to DeFasco? What happened to, to Alcan? It still exists, but yeah. well, in a different guise. Uh, Kamenko, uh, I mean, Tech uh, Minerals still is there, and that's Kamenko, but, you know, the name has disappeared. And that also uh, brings me to uh, another point. Uh, I, early on, uh, I got involved in uh, the Canadian... Research Management Association, and uh, earlier than that, I got involved in some technical uh, uh, in, uh, institutions. But uh, you know, in the '70s and '80s, it was sort of a you looked around in Canada, there were also research laboratories. Alcan had a re research laboratory in Kingston, and that's that's gone. Stelco had a, a research laboratory in in Hamilton. Which was a going concern. DeFasco did. Uh, Inco, of course, still does in Sheridan Park, and Falcon Bridge had a research laboratory as well. But there were, and then uh, look at uh, Sherrod Gordon Laboratories, and these are all hives of you know activity. There were lots of products and processes under development. Uh, maybe in the industry too. Uh, you know, I look back when we were working on the Naranda process, there were other people who had similar ideas of, you know, continuous processing of, of metal concentrates. Workra in Australia, they were developing a, a process for continuous smelting converting, interestingly, using lances. Uh, and eventually Naranda and, and uh, Gonzang Rio Tinto uh, uh, at that time got uh, together and we had a, a, an agreement to, to basically work together in a way that whichever process was, was the uh, successful one, uh, you know, maybe we'd have some 
with some involvement, you know, counter involvement. But uh, looking broadly in the non-ferrous industry, and particularly in, in copper, there were, there was the uh, Anaconda in the U.S. was looking at a hydrometallurgical process for copper, which is coming on strong. And Sherrod Gordon, of course, had its and pressure leaching, uh, ammonia leaching process uh, initially for nickel, but eventually uh, applied to copper. Kaminko got involved there. Uh, lead and zinc, there was something called the QSL process that was being, which is Quinault Schumann, they were the inventors, Lurgy, and it was a continuous smelting process for, for lead. Uh, the Japanese were also developing continuous process Mitsubishi, which was later adopted uh, by Texas Gulf and eventually operated by Falcon Bridge, <laughs> uh, was a continuous copper smelting and uh, converting refining process. And so there were a lot of new process under development. Uh, some were successful, some still uh, exist, and others just didn't make it. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much is going on now. Perhaps today the uh, the idea is that maybe you could just buy technology as opposed to developing your, your own. And there is something to be said for that. To let somebody else take the risk in, in developing yeah. a, a new process or a new product and uh, just license it uh, when it's been shown to be successful. This can make uh, good business sense in, in some uh, cases. So. But uh, the, uh, just as uh, things have changed, uh, of course, I'm not currently, I don't have the same <laughs> perspective or insight, you might say, as to what's, what's going on. If, you, um, if, you, if we look back at your, your career, um, your long career in Naranda, what would you say would be your biggest accomplishment, either personally or, or something that was accomplished under you or under your supervision supervision well that's uh i, I don't know, I never really thought much about it uh you know research is is a team effort and uh, ideas come from uh, lots of people mm -hmm. and uh, lots of people work together as a team in, in developing a, a process so, or a product and so let me rephrase it within your team uh, what um if you had to maybe pinpoint one one of the, the proudest uh, or biggest accomplishments uh, in Naranda, what would it be? Uh, that I was personally involved in? Yeah, or as a team. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Well, of course, I, uh, I have a, a special uh, uh, thing about the Naranda process because that eventually was the became the, the first continuous uh, copper smelting and converting process using what we call bath smelting, namely in a bath. And I make that distinguish distinction because uh, Arakumpu had dis uh, developed flash smelting of copper. And of course, Inco had a uh, flash smelting as well, but that was not, uh, not done in a bath as, as such. Uh, and uh, the process was also uh, later licensed uh, by some other copper uh, smelters. And that process is still used today at the horn smelter in, in Randa. So it's still going, still going strong. There have been modifications. It's not quite the same as it started out because the uh, producing the copper in the same vessel was later, later dropped for, for various reasons. So, you know, that's something that I, yeah. that I uh, particularly fond of recalling my involvement with that. Uh, and uh, I don't it, know if you be, might, sorry. But beyond that, it's, uh, you know, just the uh, satisfaction of having uh, uh, run and managed a, a, a very successful research laboratory. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, just uh, from, uh, let's see, about 1984, it was a four four year five year period. We did a an economic analysis of the results of uh, of R and D. And at the time, we took uh, ten sort of uh, of the of the accomplishments, the major accomplishments, uh, 
uh, of the research center. And these were processes, actually nine processes and one product development. And did a, uh, an economic analysis. What we did was we looked at the research costs to develop these processes and products. Uh, the capital costs to implement them industrially, because all of these were, were adopted uh, in, in the operations, and uh, looked at the cost benefits of these processes. Uh, cost, costs avoided in terms of switching from one process to another, and then eventual cost savings down, down the road. And this was done by the uh, this our economics group, and they came up uh, with a uh, a return on investment of twenty five percent, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that twenty five percent also took into account the total cost of of operating the research center. Oh, wow. So you know that was. That was quite amazing. Yeah. I guess we had not really thought of it until somebody sat down and uh, actually the did this analysis. <laughs> and uh, I was asked to actually make a presentation to Naranda's board of directors uh, about this uh, analysis to convince them of, uh, of uh, you know, the business sense, good business sense of having a, a research center. I might, um, might add that uh, uh, when I uh, uh, went on from uh, being director to vice president, chief scientist, the name of the research center was changed to Naranda Technology Center, perhaps to better reflect uh, what it was actually doing. Because research also sometimes has a connotation of, you know, uh, searching for new knowledge, and we did a little bit of that, I must say, uh, on you know, on the, at, at the time. And uh, so it became, Naranda Research became Naranda Technology Center. And at the time, uh, Naranda, uh, a couple of years before, had acquired, uh, appointed a senior vice president of technology. It was felt that there should be somebody in the corporate office responsible for research and development and technological developments. Prior to that, uh, research, reported to to operations uh, it, it originally started we had a research committee which was composed of people from the corporate office and uh, people from the operations and they operated as, as a as a research committee so you had at the time there was the we had a Canadian copper refiners which is a copper refinery in Montreal had a president, so the president was actually a member of the, and chairman of the committee for a while. Uh, there was a uh, vice president of, uh, in, uh, of uh, metallurgical operations, and he was a uh, member of the committee, and uh, Barney Morrison, uh, who was uh, also in, had been in operations and was then at, at the, uh, in the corporate office. And uh, we would uh, meet quarterly with the uh, research committee and uh, present uh, the results of our research over the past quarter and talk about our accomplishments and, and also miss us because sometimes things don't work out. And so we had a direct uh, interaction with, with operations uh, directly and indirectly. And of course, there was always liaison, close liaison with the operations in the field, like with the managers and superintendents and, and, and so forth. Uh, later, the uh, chairman was a, a senior group vice president of operations. So again, research reported right into, into operations, which was a, a very important link. And so this changed because now, instead of having that kind of a link, the link was a senior vice president of technology uh, and uh, of course, I, I don't know where, where all that went. I was, I got uh, into other things, among them uh, looking at growing trees and 
things of that sort. And the lumber business? Yeah, looking at uh, the uh, global warming. Uh, there was a, we did a little study of you know potential impacts of global warming on Naranda's operations and, and so forth. Anyways, uh, the uh, Technology Center, we celebrated our 25th anniversary in 1988, and the new uh, senior vice president of technology convinced senior management that the center should be expanded, and uh, there was a major expansion of the center in terms of new buildings, new pilot plants, uh, increasing the personnel uh, substantially. And so uh, we now had a, a major new technology center. And uh, now where is this technology center? It doesn't exist in, anymore. Where the se center was, there is, uh, it's now a, a housing development. And uh, I look at that and, and think uh, Bill Govan, our first director, he was always conscious of having a smaller, hard-hitting research group. Uh, you know, don't get too big. That was, was something that he always cautioned us about. And, uh, you know, when you get big and you, you hit hard times, uh, you're, you're a target. And during my tenure as, uh, as director, uh, Narenda went through some, uh, some hard times business-wise in terms of profitability. You know, when there were downturns mm -hmm. uh, in the economy and downturns in, in uh, consumption of metals and so forth. And there were a, a number of times we had to really tighten our belts at the research center and you know, reduce our, our costs uh, and uh, uh, not ask for a, an increase in, in our budget, but uh, either stay the course in terms of budget or even come, come back and ask for a smaller budget because these are hard times we had to uh, be part of that. And I think in part uh, the center became, as a technology center, it became a bit big. It was an obvious target if there were hard times again, you know, what do you cut? And there's this, you know, now it's no, no longer 17 million. I don't know what it came, but it's probably double that at least. You know, it becomes an obvious area to, to cut. But also, what what had what did happen was that when Falconbridge took over Miranda, and that's an interesting thing in itself, because in a way, I don't remember the figures, but I think Falconbridge was smaller than Miranda. Uh, well, but. It, Anyways, uh, it was, whether it was a merger, takeover, uh, you know, it became Falcon Bridge, no longer Naranda. And of course, Falcon Bridge had, a, had a, a research laboratory, so that eventually was a factor in the closing of the technology center. But I think there was more, more to it than I think was the, just the operating cost. And, and perhaps somebody said, you know, do we, we can buy technology. But I guess this is just uh, <laughs> conjecture on my part. But that's the way I look at it. Yeah. But as I had said earlier, it's, uh, I think it's it's sad that there's no no real Canadian international mining giant that's you know quite broad in its uh, in its operations. Yeah, you know, we're in the gold mining area. We do have uh, you know, major companies. Barrick. Barrick and Gold Corp. Uh, even Barrick's going down. And even Barrick, yeah. Uh, I, but, had, I had interviewed uh, Peter Monk. Okay. And uh, we had talked about a similar subject about not, not only the mining and metallurgy business, but basically any big Canadian named company seemed to have a downfall. Yeah. It seemed to, they never seem to last. And yeah. what was it? <laughs> Be interesting to know what he had to say about that. Yeah, but, and, he, and he even mentioned Barrick, which is isn't doing as well as it yeah. necessarily well used to. dependent on in that case on on one metal they have tried to expand into copper mm -hmm. uh but maybe at the wrong time because uh, you know price of gold and that's what Narenda faced over the years the price of copper you know it jumped up and down the price of zinc and uh, lead and, and aluminum and uh, you know that brings me back uh, also 
uh, to the center again. And that is that we had a significant product development uh, activity. Um, and the idea was to uh, expand the markets for some of the metals that Miranda produced by uh, developing new, new products. Now, the approach to new products was primarily through uh, things like alloy developments. And uh, Miranda Research Center uh, did develop a, a new zinc aluminum alloy. So here was an alloy that could be used for producing uh, a variety of castings. Um, but uh, that it used both two, two metals that Miranda was producing, the zinc and aluminum. And it was called the ZA series. And uh, ZA27 was a, a trade name for the, one of these alloys. I don't know where it is uh, today, uh, but uh, it was an important development at the time. Um, we also looked at uh, applications of byproducts uh, such as selenium in the uh, gold refining process. One of the byproducts are selenium and tellurium, you get bismuth and so forth. And uh, our researchers came up with a, a, a xerographic plate using selenium. Now, I should step back to xerography. It actually is based on, on selenium. There's a, there's a drum which is coated with selenium, and that is the active uh, ingredient that picks up the photons and, uh, and then eventually makes, uh, contributes to the actual photo image that you get in a, in a printer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had some a research group that looked at producing these plates, but with an improved improve sensitivity uh, by, mani by manipulating the composition of, of, the, of the selenium and how it was applied to the plate. And the particular application that we looked at was for mammography, because in mammography you use a, a plate to image uh, the breast. Mm -hmm. But traditionally it was a, 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 like a, a silver-based photographic plate. And uh, we looked at, uh, well, why not use selenium, which you could use in a similar way as, as you do in xerography. But it's more precise. And it's more precise. It could uh, pick up, uh, you know, uh, any problems there in a, because it was, it was, it's uh, precision in terms of the size of, of uh, abnormalities was, was much, much better. And it was actually, uh, you know, tested in, in the field. I don't know where where it ended up, uh, but that was one of the uh, pro potential product applications we looked at. There was a spin-off eventually uh, from this that there was a company established in Montreal by some former members of the Miranda Technology Center to uh, produce high purity uh, selenium, uh, tellurium, and other byproducts of copper refining. So there is a spin-off out there uh, I forget what it's called, uh, three, 3M three or uh, not 3M, anyways, there is a, a smell. Hmm. So it just shows you how you, <laughs> how you can, uh, you know, broaden your, your aspects of research. Uh, with a bit of, uh, yeah, yeah, research. Yeah. Hmm. What else? Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, switch it up a little bit. Um, I often ask this question just because it's uh, it's often often get a similar answer, but um, because you worked more in the research and development and lab and the, the tech part of um, of mining and metallurgy, um, how present or absent were women in the workplace, and and how did that change or not throughout your career? Uh, well. Uh in my time, uh, there were a lot of women in, uh, you know, in, in uh, the kind of science uh, we were involved in, say, metallurgy or and, and, and mining. And I'll get back to back to that. Uh, but we did have some women scientists. Uh, uh, one in particular, uh, uh, Lucy Rosado was her name, and uh, I still fondly remember. Uh, interviewing her when she came to the research center uh, seeking a job. She was a, 
I graduated with a degree in, in chemistry from Concordia University. And she proved to be a, a real, uh, real, real gem as a, as a researcher. And just as an indication of that, she eventually uh, moved on to her zinc plant, Canadian Electrolyting Zinc, and was technical superintendent and eventually was manager of the plant. And unfortunately, she died early, uh, uh, had cancer. But uh, she developed, uh, and her team developed a process for uh, for uh, treating the uh, what we call zinc residue in the zinc plant. You uh, you extract the zinc from from the ore. And I won't go into the process, but it's uh, basically a roasting hydrometallurgical process. But you end up with the iron being in an iron residue, and that's a problem for disposal. Uh, where, where do you put it? And uh, at CZ, there was limited space for this. And, uh, she and her team developed a, uh, a system where you could uh, dispose of the residue in a much more uh, land efficient way. You could pile it up as opposed to it sort of flowing and filling a pond. And, okay. Uh, but she was involved in other hydrometallurgical developments and there's been even a symposium in her memory. And so anyways, uh, there, there's one. And we had uh, several other women uh, scientists. But uh, more of the women were technicians on the, uh, okay. you know, on the technical side, typically in the analytical laboratory. Uh, so it wasn't uh, any 50-50 or no. anything like that. Yet. No. Uh, still, I mean, still not in the uh, natural, history, uh, yeah. natural resource yeah. world, yeah. for sure. I mentioned uh, mining. I'm probably rambling here. But uh, another uh, uh, accomplishment, uh, I look at it, that, uh, that I was quite pleased with, was uh, that we developed uh, research in mining. When, uh, when I started Research Center, there was certainly no, uh, no research in, in the mining field. And, eventually, and we, we did do work on the, in the mineral processing field. Uh, and it became obvious that Little Naranda is a major mining company. Uh, we buy our mining technology from others, and shouldn't we be looking at developing some of her own. And at the time, uh, with the help of a professor at Queen's University, a, a business professor, developed a proposal to develop uh, and start a mining technology division at the Miranda Research Center. And uh, we presented that uh, to uh, you know, the, the powers that be, <laughs> research committee and the uh, Miranda executive. And uh, they agreed that we would start a mining technology division. And we hired a, uh, a mining engineer who was particularly, uh, his particular field was rock mechanics. And he put, quickly put together a team looking at uh, rock mechanics. You know, this, uh, what can we do to improve the stability of the underground operations? And uh, the, uh, they also later looked at remote control of uh, mining equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was a, a merger with the instrumentation department, which had been established uh, at the research center. That was after I arrived, but uh, during my, my tenure. We had, uh, in particular, one hotshot uh, scientist who was very good at it, uh, applying uh, physics to solving uh, industrial uh, problems. And uh, he and his team uh, were developed a number, a number of uh, instruments of one kind or another. Uh, one was a, a magnograph, it's, that's the technical name, something which has, had been licensed, it was licensed to another company a system for detecting faults in wire rope and uh, mine hoist rope. Because huh. uh, mine and the, the rope used in mine uh, hoisting eventually curls or yeah. wires break and you have to you know, detect this sooner than later uh, for obvious reasons. There were instruments available but not entirely satisfactory and so our uh, research group uh, developed an improved uh, technique using a magnetic magnetic field, hence the name magnograph. 
they also came up with a, a way of measuring the temperature in a, in a copper bath, uh, copper smelting bath, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, called a TWIR parameter, those same TWIRs that you inject air, yeah. you could actually look into the bath. And uh, measure the temperature. And so they came up with a way of measuring that temperature without interfering with the operation of the TWIRs. Now, TWIRs have to be what they call punched. You push a rod through it to clear any slag, you've got to keep them open. If you don't do that, they would just block up with slag that freezes in there. So this instrument has to sort of get in, take a temperature, and get out of the way, basically. Yeah. And that was also uh, licensed. Uh, it's probably still available somewhere out there, probably not under its original name. But the, uh, the same uh, person in charge of this group, Frank Kitzinger is his name, uh, uh, quite a remarkable man in my opinion, uh, also looked at, uh, is there some other way we can blast rock? And he came up with the idea of, of using electricity to blast rock. And uh, this de uh, was developed uh, to a fairly late, uh, fairly advanced state. The idea was you drill a hole, your drill holes, standard, your typical drill holes, but instead of loading them with dynamite, uh, you put in a, 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 a liquid in there, which is a conductor, you put in an electrode, uh, and you discharge a very high energy electric impulse. And you get, you get the same effect as you do with a, with a blasting agent, you get a sudden expansion of gas, but you're not using explosives. And uh, so this, uh, the Mining Technology Division uh, developed this from the, you know, circular laboratory to starting to actually blast big blocks of, of rock and eventually testing it in the field. Uh, it didn't prove to be commercially successful. I was, was going to say, it, it, it sounds more expensive than dynamite. Right yeah, now. well, there were some, you know, not... It, it, a nice nice idea, it works very well, uh, but there are some, you know, practical drawbacks uh, yeah. to it. Uh, but it could, could have been used for yeah, breaking up large boulders, because in mining, when you blast, uh, your rock isn't all small. You Sometimes you get a large piece which will not go down an ore pass and has to be broken up. They use mechanical means typically. Here you could actually drill a hole in it and, and uh, you know break it up that way. In quarries, they call that secondary blasting where yeah. they break up uh, ore, open pit mines. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, that was a... So the mining technology uh, uh, division, as we called it at that time, uh, it became quite, quite, yeah. quite successful too. So that's one of the things that I was involved with. That, uh, okay. um, if we shift a little bit from mining into um, your own interests, one of, the, one of your big interests uh, that you had mentioned when you were a child was, is geology. Yeah. yeah. Now, what, uh, what yeah. work have you done uh, well, I, before we, on your own? Before we talk about that, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about my professional uh, association uh, oh, sure. involvements. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, your, yeah, your organization. Yeah, or early so. on, uh, Dr. Govan always uh, encouraged the uh, scientists and engineers to get involved in, in uh, scientific and technical organizations. Uh, now we call it networking today. Yeah. I don't think we used the word then. But also, this is a way of you know, seeing what's, what's new. Uh, in the metallurgical industry, uh, these, uh, the Canadian Institute of Mining Metallurgy, but more importantly, probably the American Institute of Mining Metallurgy and the and the what was then called the Metallurgical Society of AIME, American Institute of Mining Metallurgy, was a, a bit of a forum where you would, I remember, you know, you're going to a meeting and you would see people from copper industry, you know, smelter superintendents and uh, researchers for other copper companies, and you had a real networking opportunity. And in the, in the non-ferrous metallurgical industry at that time, I don't know how it is now, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I visited many copper smelters and zinc and lead smelters over, over my uh, career. 
uh, you know, as a researcher, but people from operations would do the same and they, we would receive them in, in our operations and they would look at how we're doing things. We looked at how they're doing things and you would pick up ideas for, you know, improving your own operation, not in a big way because they didn't tell you about their secrets yeah. as, as such, you know, the, but uh, you would see things that, hey, this is a good idea. We never thought of that. And so there was a lot of that. This was aside from the actual technical papers where people uh, presented papers on their operations, describing their operations in, in, in great detail, but that's where you learned a lot as well. So we were you know, encouraged to, to, to participate. Join. I got involved in the uh, Metallurgical Society of, of uh, CIM early on, and uh, uh, I was uh, program chairman of the Conference of Metallurgists uh, one year, another year I was chairman of the conference and oh, okay. got involved in uh, various committees. Uh, one of the committees that would interest you, uh, uh, I founded a historical metallurgy committee huh? to uh, look at and document uh, the history of metallurgy in Canada in particular. And we used to publish papers in what was called the CIM Bulletin at the time and uh, on various historical aspects of Canadian metallurgy and, and mining. We also published a, a book on uh, on the uh, history of mining and metallurgy in, in Canada. And uh, then I also got involved in the Metallurgical Society of AIME at the time, uh, and worked in various committees. It was a pyrometallurgy committee. Uh, these committees uh, organized symposium, uh, symposia in uh, various topics. Uh, the non-ferrous uh, pyrometallurgy committee that I was involved with, we would organize a, a uh, lead zinc tin symposium, which brought people in from the international lead zinc tin community together and present technical papers and also interface and, uh, uh, and so forth. There was a symposium on copper uh, metallurgy and, and others. And that was a big thing with the uh, Metallurgical Society of AIME, not so much with the Conference of Metallurgists at, at the time. And uh, so I, I got quite involved with uh, the Metallurgical Society of AIME. And uh, eventually uh, I was nominated and appointed uh, elected president of uh, the Metallurgical Society. And uh, that's something I'm also uh, proud of in a way that I was the first Canadian yeah. to be president of the American you know, of the American Metallurgical Society. Uh, there were there were two there were have been successors since, and so at one time I was sitting on the board of trustees of the American Institute of Mining Metallurgy. There was a Canadian there, so yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. so that was very uh, satisfying. I also got involved in the Canadian Research Management Association. Yeah, you were telling me. Which was a forum for research managers in, in all fields uh, across Canada, where we talked about uh, those technical sessions, uh, short sessions. But we also uh, developed position papers on uh, various aspects of R&D in, in Canada. And eventually, uh, when I was also the uh, chairman of, of that uh, committee. And uh, I, probably as a result of all this, um, I was asked whether I would sit on the Minister's National Advisory Committee to CANMET, Canada Centre for Energy for Minerals and Energy Technology. And uh, I agreed. And uh, I was later appointed chairman of, of, uh, of MNAC, as we called it. And this was a committee that responded directly to the Federal Minister of Natural Resources. At the time I was chairman, it was Jake Epp. And uh, so it was an opportunity. What we did was uh, two things. One, we reviewed the programs of CANMET, which is, of course, a federal agency, research agency. Uh, we, on our uh, committee, we had representatives from mining metallurgy uh, sectors the companies, all, all from industry. And uh, so we reviewed the programs, offered our advice on the, on the programs, uh, and also reported uh, 
our views on, on the programs to the minister. So we would actually sit down with the Minister of Natural Resources and... Uh, mm. Advise. And advise, yeah. You know, you know, so that was an interesting experience yeah. as well. Anyway... Uh, Where are, you, um, are you going to the MedSoc um, conference in Toronto? In no, I, no. Uh, I've sort of, you know, once I retired, yeah. I retired from metallurgy. For sure. and, and I keep, I keep t in touch. I mean, I'm still obviously a member of CIM. And I'm, of course, I was president. In, uh, Did you go um, two months ago there? To, uh, no, I, uh, for Montreal? personal reasons, I, I, I couldn't go. Oh, uh, yes. I yeah. remember asking. Uh, and that was a satisfactory, uh, you know, to to uh, be president of CIM, which, uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah, I've been <laughs> rather deeply involved in, yeah. in many organizations of, over the years, and there's a sense of satisfaction there as well. And, uh, anyway, I think you want to talk about geology. Sure. Well, your, your interest <laughs> that turned into more than an interest, I guess. Yeah, well, I uh, was always interested in geology, and as I mentioned, uh, I decided not to pursue it as a career, but I pursued minerals as, as a hobby, as an avocation. And over the years, uh, it became uh, sort of more, more serious. Uh, where, where really things uh, took off was that uh, uh, about the time I, I returned to Canada from, from grad school, uh, there was a quarry operating in Mont Saint-Hilaire and uh, this quarry started to produce a lot of interesting minerals. Uh, I won't go into the geology, which is fascinating, but this quarry has over the years uh, produced uh, currently about 66 species, mineral species new to science. And this is quite amazing. There's only one or two other places in the world that have produced as many new minerals in a you know, one single place, a quarry, and uh, I uh, developed a sort of a, a relationship with uh, some academic professors, university professors in, in the field of mineralogy and, and geology and work with them, and I would uh, take samples to them to have a look at because they look, to me they look different, I uh, wasn't sure what they were. And, and uh, it was a, a, co a collaboration they received material to to do research on and uh, so i was uh, have been involved in uh, discovering uh, a number of uh, new mineral species uh, i forget the number but they're maybe six or ten or something like that and one one actually was named after me and uh, which is called uh, petarocyte <laughs> which is a sodium zirconium silicate you know? and uh I've always, you know, had an interest in the scientific side of minerals. There are mineral collectors, but they don't know too much about mineralogy, you know, they care, but I've always been interested in the scientific. I've been a member of the Mineralogical Association of Canada for, for a long time. I used to be a member of the American Mineralogical Association. And uh, I'm actually a co-author on, on a number of scientific papers on, on minerals. Uh, both here in Canada and also with uh, somebody in Russia, <laughs> surprisingly, but not surprising if I would tell you the you know, why, because of the similarity of the geology of this quarry to uh, the geology of uh, some places in Russia. And so it's become, uh, a, a, it keeps my uh, the, the sort of um, gray, gray cells from getting gray. <laughs> Because uh, you know, it's it's a, uh, a, a intellectual uh, stimulus, a scientific stimulus. I'm always interested in science. I'm getting more and more interested in the broad aspects of science. I'm also uh, some years ago, and this is uh, now oh, ten years ago. Um, as a child, I often uh, went to look at the minerals at the Redpath Museum at McGill University, which is a natural science. Uh, a natural history museum and of course when I was at McGill and uh, about 10 years ago I was asked to uh, to be involved in uh, developing new mineral exhibits with a professor from uh, Earth and Planetary Science Department and so this was we completely developed completely new 
exhibits um, about minerals. So I got involved in uh, selecting specimens and developing the themes of uh, the displays and and so forth. And uh, the museum asked me to, uh, you know, sort of if I would continue working on their mineral collection, which I agreed to. And it was, uh, they appointed me as an honorary curator of mineralogy, which, and so uh, one of my current occupations, one day a week, I go off to the museum and work on the mineral collection. I'm oh, yeah. currently their sort of mineral <laughs> go-to person, <Yeah. laughs> mineralogy go-to person. Yeah. So, uh, so as uh, I often ask that to you, um, to many of the, I guess, retired folks, um, I always ask them if if they're truly retired or if they actually do um, a few professional things on the side still. So I guess that would be that yeah, would kind well, of be one curator. Uh, yeah. Well, in my case, when I uh, retired, uh, I retired early, as you may have surmised, uh, and. Uh, that that was a uh, well, I was a victim of circum circumstance, you might say, because this senior vice president of technology decided to leave Naranda, and uh, at that time, so there was uh, two people reporting to him, myself and the director of research and development, and uh, you know, the, I guess the uh, Naranda executive decided, well, maybe they don't really need a, you know. A, replace the the senior vice president that retired so they appointed the then the research and uh, director of research and development as a uh, vice president vice president senior vice president and director of research and development and it sort of left me hanging so we came to an agreement and i left the company uh, uh, and uh, I did a bit of consulting for a while, okay. some for Miranda. But in my field, research and development, uh, it's not a field, it's not like, you know, having developed a mine or built a, a metallurgical plant or anything, you know, what you, what you can offer is, there's a lot of other people who can offer much the same <laughs> kind of advice. So it, uh, I did a bit, but not really much okay. uh, and know, that, professionally. And now you would say, you're but I I keep myself busy with uh, you know minerals and mineralogy and uh, and birding and birding, which is a you know a pastime, and uh, uh, I don't do much uh, watching of television or anything like that. I do a lot of uh, reading, uh, in particularly in the mineralogical and geological fields, but I also keep up with what's happening in the mining and metallurgical world. Uh, through uh, mining metallurgical publications, uh, Canadian Mining Journal and the uh, CIM magazine yeah. and, and so forth. So yeah, I keep in touch and see what's what's going on. And I do go to some of the conferences if they're in Montreal, the uh, Conference of Metallurgists, or the uh, CIM annual meeting and uh, touch base that way. And there is a uh, an annual uh, dinner for CIM past presidents, and uh, through in Montreal, I typically go to them, and so you know I keep keep in touch. Right on. But the main thing is to keep busy, and uh, uh, the intellectual stimulation is is Absolutely. very important, and that's something I enjoy at the Red Path Museum because there's a there is a uh, a large research group at the Red Path. Not in not in the field as I'm interested in, but there uh, it's a leading uh, there's there's a leading group in paleontology, particularly uh, in the evolution of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a group on uh, marine uh, freshwater uh, ecology. Uh, uh, there's another group on uh, in the field of uh, biodiversity and there's some leading researchers uh, and so I have a chance to uh, you know talk to these professors uh, I mean they're just colleagues as far as I'm concerned and they're students and uh, I attend lectures and seminars and uh, occasionally I, I've even given a seminar and um, recently uh, 
the museum had a, a public series of lectures about uh, the areas that the museum is involved with and uh, I was one of the lecturers and uh, talking about mineralogy so I get my my stimulation that way yeah. and I also publish uh, fairly extensively in the uh, field of mineralogy not only the scientific side but in the there is there are um, mineralogical magazines that are called that appeal to both uh, amateur mineralogists and mineral collectors as well as uh, professionals. professionals and I've published a number of articles, uh, researched them and published them. Okay. So I keep myself uh, very busy. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Mm -hmm. um, I'll finish with uh, two questions. Um, one may be a bit tough, but I guess we can split it in two. Um, but looking back at your life in general, um, if you had to choose, what are you proudest of? And we could split it in <laughs> with through your life and professionally. We can do both if that's easier as well. Well, uh, in my life, I'm proudest of my family. <laughs> well, Good I, answer. <laughs> my wife and uh, three children, uh, all, uh, all uh, graduated from university. One, one is an architect, practicing architect. Uh, one work is an economist, works for uh, Statistics Canada, and uh, one was from the University of Ottawa, was in the book publishing business, but now works for Humber College in, in Ontario in their uh, alumni uh, department. Uh, so I'm proud of, proud of my family. Uh, I'm proud of, uh, you know, having participated in, uh, in uh, the uh, mining and metallurgical industry, both through you know, technical, uh, my, my, I would say modest technical accomplishments, uh, my managerial uh, work, uh, societies, associations involved. Uh, I've had an interesting, uh, yeah, bit of everything, bit interesting life in, in mining metallurgy. I'm, I'm proud of the industry. I'm a strong supporter of the industry. Uh, I, I'm not an environmentalist. I, I appreciate nature, uh, but I feel that uh, the public and the media uh, just don't understand the impact of mining and metallurgy on, on the environment as, as to what it is. And one example I often uh, like to, uh, to point out and in fact, in the uh, mineral exhibits at, uh, at the Red Path Museum, I've incorporated, and this was part of where the minerals come from. So that gives us, gave me an, asp an opportunity to talk about mines. So uh, if you see uh, copper minerals from Gaspé Copper, there's a photograph there of one of these big trucks hauling ore from an open pit because, hey, that's where the minerals come from. And, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, the mining industry, I don't think, is getting through to the public as to the importance of minerals. Yeah, in our everyday lives. You know this expression, if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. And I often use that in talking to people, students, uh, uh, children coming through the museum, if I have a chance, you know, think about where, where yeah, what you use, where does it come yeah. from? And as far as the impact on the environment, you know, I've talked about this uh, too. You take a plane, fly over the, the boreal forest, and find me a mine there. And you know, yeah, there's a speck down there. It's got some gray stuff about it. But look at what's around it. You know, the in terms of the impact. People talk about the environmental impact of of mines. Who talks about the environmental impact of new housing developments or shopping centers. Does anybody, do you see some of these organizations, and I'll name one, Greenpeace protesting a new shopping center? No, well, but a mine, oh my God, we don't want that in our backyard. And the, and the exaggeration of, uh, of the impact, uh, asbestos. Now I mention asbestos because my wife comes from Thetford Mines, which is an mm -hmm. asbestos yeah. mining area. I was married in a 
this Tedford Mines. <laughs> and uh, I had a president of one of the asbestos companies was uh, was uh, at the wedding. My my wife actually, her one of her godfathers was uh, an executive and asbestos mining company. So I have a certain relationship. <laughs> But, you know, ex again, people, yes, we know it's, uh, it, 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 potentially it's a carcinogen, but, you know, under what circumstances? People now, and I, I experienced this uh, through my mineral in involvement in the museum, and, a, uh, and an association of mineral museum professionals as well that I'm involved with, the idea that, you know, you know if you look at a, asbestos, mineral it's going to do something to you it's an exaggeration do people realize that when you remove asbestos bearing material from a building you're creating more of a potential problem than just leaving it there you know this is not reported in in, in the media it, the, the media tends to talk to the people that are most vocal about you know what's wrong with with a mineral product or with a mining operation and so forth. And somehow I feel that the uh, mining industry through uh, the Mining Association of Canada and, and the like doesn't really get through to the public yeah. as much as it could. Yeah, there is uh, the uh, aspect associated with the CIM convention, for example, uh, but we're now, uh, fortunately, the two uh, venues for the CIM annual meeting are to Toronto and, uh, and Vancouver. So you, you do uh, have a large uh, urban community and their children that you, you can approach. But beyond that, uh, we have a mining week in Canada. Do I see anything in the local paper about the mining yeah, week? I, I don't see anything. So I don't think the industry is, is doing a good enough job in, in presenting its side of, of the story. And something we have, again, going back to the Red Path Museum, is uh, there is a quarry in Montreal, it's now long uh, abandoned, uh, which produced a number of new mineral species. Uh, and uh, I have a photograph in the uh, of the quarry, as it is now, in the display. And you look at the quarry, and what do you see? Green. It's been taken over by nature. There's some ponds there with water and, and uh, vegetation around them. There's some trees there. There are, I can take you to uh, my, and I'm sure there are many of these across Canada, one in particular that I think of in, in Ontario. Uh, at, at the time that it was a mine, this was back in the early, 20th century, uh, late 19th century, it was a mountainside, just, you know, bare mountainside, just rock. You go there, you can't find it, because it's nature covered. soon, soon takes over. Rocks disintegrate at the surface, eventually form soil, and plants take over, and, and organisms, and animals, and so even that quarry that is supposedly an eyesore on the flank of Mont Saint-Hilaire, uh, eventually, uh, it's going to be taken over by, by nature. But the public doesn't seem to understand that. Yeah. Well, I'll get off my, <laughs> my no, soapbox. I, <laughs> I absolutely understand what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, we have, um, that's true, it's kind of, mining seems removed from the rest of society. And it's true that there's not a lot of, um, there's not a, a, a big relationship between society and mining and and the connection between mining and the end products yeah you know, and, and what, enough. yeah what am i using right now that yeah comes yeah from, yeah what, yeah, what, what is in there that came absolutely yeah, every, everybody with their iphones don't realize exactly. how much mining exactly there goes into an, it, an iPhone. it either came from a, a mineral product somewhere or uh, it came from petroleum yeah you know? <laughs> yeah absolutely or possibly it, it grew but you don't see wood in too many technology, no. you know, things. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. So no. there you go. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we'll finish with one question, probably one of my favorites. Um, if you were to speak to someone much, uh, much younger, like a student or someone like that, uh, what would be the one life lesson or piece of advice you, you would give them? 
right now. Ah, well, uh, well I want to go back to uh, my mentors because uh, I think one of sure. your questions was about uh, mentors. Uh, the mentors I see in my life, and we didn't talk about what I did as a child, but anyway, so it'll come up. Uh, I was a Boy Scout. I was a Cub Scout. So was I. I was a Boy Scout. I was even in Rover Scouts. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in, in the scouting movement. And one of the people I think back was a scout leader who happened to be trained as a geologist, and he encouraged my interest in, in minerals. In high school, I had a chemistry teacher who encouraged my interest in, in science and in particular in, in chemistry. And he used to let me stay in the lab after, after school hours and do some experiments or little tests here and there. And he gave me some books to read. And I still remember his encouragement of, you know, of uh, science. My father, because, uh, you know, as an immigrant, he wanted me to get uh, you know, a good education. He always stressed the importance of getting an education. Professor McEwen at McGill had pointed me in the direction of graduate school, and he, he was an important person in my, in my life. Bob Boyle I mentioned earlier on the Geological Survey of Canada, who, who taught me how to write, and I maintain a lifelong uh, connection with him. I always stopped in to see him if I was in Ottawa at the GSC, and uh, he visited here sometimes, and uh, so there were people all along uh, the uh, in my life that uh, uh, in Miranda, I it was somebody called Barney Morrison. He was chairman of the research committee, but I had a nice relationship with him, and we often talked. And uh, he was a person I I looked looked to. And uh, anyways, uh, so. I think you have to work hard, I think uh, study hard, uh, look at science, there's lots of opportunities in, in science. Maybe it doesn't really matter what, you have to uh, find something that you enjoy. That's very important in, in whatever kind of work one does, you have to enjoy what you're doing. That's, that's a, and obviously there have to be some, some rewards. Uh, uh, as far as opportunities, my, I, I think opportunities, you take them as they come. Uh, there are crossroads in, in anybody's career that uh, may or may not uh, work out. Uh, in my own uh, career, uh, I, I had other opportunities while I was with Naranda. Um, at one point, uh, I was asked whether I'd be interested, this was early on, in uh, working at the Gaspé copper smelter, uh, you know, joining the, uh, in other words, getting into operations, and at the time I decided I'd continue in research. And uh, later I was also asked whether I'd be interested in, in uh, working at the copper refinery in a technical capacity, and again I stayed in research. But, you know, you take, take these as they come and uh, assess them and decide. and. Uh, uh, I, I think opportunity comes knocking as long as you, uh, you know, work hard, uh, do do a good job, uh, and uh, but education that's yeah. you know that's the the basis. Get a good education uh, and in whatever field you're 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 interested in, uh, and you, even education uh, can take you in, in many different directions. Uh, at one uh, stage, I was on an advisory committee at the University of British Columbia in their uh, metallurgy uh, department. And one of the uh, PhD students there that, uh, that uh, we looked at his, his work eventually decided to give up uh, metallurgy and he became a professional musician. So <laughs> At the PhD level? Yeah, at the wow. PhD. Well, he had a PhD in metallurgy, but he became a musician. So you never know where you know things will will take you. Obviously, he he took the path that interested him in the most. And looking back, uh, I think most of us, I certainly can look back and think, well, you know, I might have been just as interested and happy doing something in the chemical engineering field or the field of chemistry or maybe geology or mineralogy. I don't know. There's you have to be and. 
I think it's you have to be interested in what goes on in the world around you. Uh, you know, take an interest in, in science and technology. That's because it's, it's fascinating what goes on in science now, especially compared to when I started out. And uh, and certainly lots of opportunities in, in science and technology for a, any young people. Uh, that's not to say that uh, pursuing a career in, in other fields uh, won't be successful, but uh, have a look. And for parents, I think encourage your children to, you know, study hard, but let them let them make their own decisions as what they should do. I never tried to influence uh, our children. That was their decision. And they as, all took uh, very different paths. As, yeah, very different paths. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my sons who was going to follow me and uh, was at Queens for a while decided that wasn't for him. But I think he, on his own, decided he was going to follow my path, but obviously it wasn't for him. So okay. <laughs> he's the economist now. <laughs> yeah, a little different. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, this has been rather wide-ranging, but anyways. Yes, well, that's, <laughs> I've enjoyed it. <laughs> that's point of uh, part of the interview. <laughs>